Ah, this meat is broken! Hello, hello, Steve, the Canadian Sasquatch, coming at you with Meatology Week 8, where we're talking about problems and troubleshooting. Uh, today's going to be a whole lot of chatty and not very showy, so uh, first thing, let's do a little bit of the showy, though, that we do have. So, um, the Joe's Ancient Orange. How's everybody's doing? Let's take a look at how mine's doing. Alright, so here it is, Week 8. <sighs> It's looking very nice. See on the bottom there, it is swirling up as I spin it, but that will drop down again. I'm not too worried about that. Looking very good. There you have it. It's looking pretty good. Cannot wait next week. We're going to dive right into that guy and sample it. And it's going to be, oh, it's going to be good. Cannot wait for that, but... We have to. One more week. Today's problems and troubleshootings, I'm just going to chat about some of the various issues that I've run across myself and how I've handled them and some of the other issues that could arise and how to either prevent them or mitigate them or if it's already happened, what you can do after the fact. Uh, there's not much we can do with some of it because we're dealing with yeast and yeast as a living thing they have a mind of their own and they'll do what they want whether we want them to do it or not so we just got to work through what we can do with the yeast let's start off talking about uh stalled or stuck or non even non-start ferments uh there are several issues that could be because of this uh Say you pitch your yeast and one and two one or two days go by and uh, nothing happens. Uh, it could be bad yeast. The yeast are out of date. Uh, what you can do with that is just go ahead and pitch some more yeast. Uh, hopefully a fresh batch of what you're using. Or if it's been two or more days, then I would go with uh, pitching the Lavalin EC 1118. As we talked about back in week three uh, with yeast, the EC1118 is a heck of a yeast. It just chugs through everything. So if there are any issues with it, with the must, then that particular yeast should be able to get in there and start chugging away at the stuff. But even if some of the other wild yeasts or other bugs have gotten into it at that point, the EC1118 does have the potential to go in and kill off and deal with those yeasts, treat them as food and just cannibalize them. So yeah, if you've uh, had an issue with your meat not fermenting, like starting off within one or two days, that's essentially what you uh, need to go about doing. Just pitch some new yeast or pitch the 1118. So another issue that could arise is after several days, the fermentation just completely stalls out. Uh, one of the things that this could be is a bad pH. So the yeast like the pH to be around 3.6 to 3.9. And pH is essentially the uh, base to acid balance. And it likes a little bit more on the acidic side. Uh, if it becomes, uh, let's talk about how to measure it. Cheap and easy, litmus papers. You may remember these from uh, school. It's just a little jug. There's like a hundred of them in here. You put a drop right there and it will change color. And based on the color, it will tell you roughly what the pH is. And like I said, we want a pH around 3.6 to 3.9. So in between these two right here, for this type of paper, there are different 
different uh, types that may have different colors. Uh, or you could even get a pH meter, which will tell you exactly what the pH is. But I'm cheap, and it was $7, and there's 100 of them in here, and it's good to go. So with those, I usually take three samples because there's variance between each of the strips and I just average it out. Now if the rare case that the uh, pH is too high, that means it has too high of a base to it, then what you need to do is just get some fresh lemon and squeeze them and just add the juice because lemon juice is acidic and it won't add too much flavor and that'll bump up the acidity just enough to uh, smooth things out. And depending on how much must you have and what the pH really is, that depends on how much you add. So I can't say, oh, just add like a tablespoon and you'll be fine. It really depends on a whole lot of variables of what is being done with it. Um, a more common problem though is the pH is too low. That means it's too acidic. Um, so some of the things that we can do to that is add potassium carbonate. Um, I don't have carbonate, I have potassium bicarbonate. It's just powder, uh, little crystals. Uh, we like to use potassium bicarbonate because the yeast like potassium. Um, something else that you can add is uh, calcium carbonate. Uh, that will work uh, just fine. Uh, the calcium will make it a little bit cloudy for a little bit longer. Um, if you don't have any of those, then most likely you do have sodium bicarbonate. Most households have this someplace in their kitchen, either in the fridge to help with smells. I don't recommend using that because you'll be adding those smells to your mead. But yes, baking soda, you can use that to help uh, bring the pH back up. Again, it all depends on how, what the pH is and how big of a batch you're making it will depend on how much you add. And you really want to add just a little bit at a time. Uh, essentially, you add a little bit, you mix it, and it will cause an MEA, a large one. Have you ever added? it? baking soda and vinegar together. That's essentially what we're doing here, creating a big MEA. Um, so mix it, let it sit for 30 minutes or so, and then check it again, because it needs a little bit of time to react and all that. So that's how you handle the pH. So what if you think that the yeasts have finished already? Well, you really need to check the gravity to see if the yeast have chug through all of the sugars that are in the mead. Um, it could happen that the yeast finish chewing through everything within a couple of days. If you've got a huge yeast and it's warm out, uh, they will do their job and uh, chug right through real quick. Uh, if, if that's the case, then great. Rack it off and uh, continue on the secondary. Uh, but if that's not the case, then you want to check the pH like we just talked about, make sure that's okay. If that's okay, then uh, maybe the yeast just uh, stalled out. They weren't very good yeast. Uh, so I would chuck in another pack of what you're using, uh, making sure that they are fresh, just like uh, if it was a non-start. Uh, the other thing you can do is, once again, the EC1118 toss that in there, get that going, uh, just to make sure everything is uh, taken care of with the yeast. Uh, that way you don't have issues with some wild bugs getting in there or anything like that. We uh, use the 1118 pretty much any time we wanna uh, restart or make sure we have a really strong ferment going after we've already attempted using the yeast that we wanna use. And if that uh, doesn't work, then the mead really is done. And uh, if the gravity is still pretty high, that means 
it was a very high original gravity or there's some other issues like the pH or whatnot. So uh, give that a whirl. So what happens if you accidentally put a dose of metabisulfites in there? You go, you grab your potassium bicarbonate, but instead of potassium bicarbonate, you actually grab the sodium metabisulfites or the potassium metabisulfites. That could be problematic. Um, one thing that you can do is just beat the hell out of it, uh, whip it up, use the drill powered thing, uh, just really get a strong degassing. Don't worry too much about the oxidization uh, at this point. You don't want to do too much of that, but you definitely want to like really get that whipped up so you can, any of the gases that are produced by the metabisulfites, because remember it produces the sulfur gas and that's what kills everything. So we really want that whipped up and released out of the must. Uh, then I would let that set overnight. And then once again, whip it up again, degas it. Uh, a little bit of oxygenization doesn't hurt it, but don't try to do it on purpose. We just really want to get all that sulfur out of there. And then once again, our problem yeast sulfur, the EC1118, that's the one that we want to use because it is a very strong, hardy yeast and it can withstand some of the metabisulfite uh, issues. So get that going. Uh, I would probably even create a starter with it so that first day when you've got the yeast or the must all whipped up and you're gonna let it sit overnight. Uh, get some EC1118 going uh, and just some sugar water to get a nice big one liter starter or whatever going. And then after you do the second degassing, just dump that whole thing in there and let those uh, yeast do their thing. Uh, I would even on the next day, uh, get back in there and stir them up again and get them going. Uh, this could help save the day with the metabisulfites. If not, then what you have is a very sweet mead and just go ahead and make a very dry, dry mead. And then you just blend the two and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Mold! What can we do about mold? Well, first, the best is to prevent mold. Uh, the best way to do that is it's usually going to happen when you have a melomel happening. So you got that fruit cap on top, like in the Joe's Ancient Orange there. We had like the raisins and the oranges up top. Uh, what we can do is uh, on a daily basis, just go over there and punch that down into the mead. That way, it, if there's anything on top of it, it gets pushed underneath and the mold can't grow in the liquid and eventually there'll be enough alcohol in there that that will kill off any of the mold spores or anything and it'll eventually stop uh, the ability for mold to grow and eventually the fruit will drop to the bottom at which point again the mold can't do anything about it but if we do have mold growing uh, so I've had this issue myself and what I did was basically I punch it down and then I do a little bit of the so, uh, potassium metabisulfites in there just just a little bit just to try and kill off the mold whip it up as I mentioned previously on accidentally adding the metabisulfites and then chuck in the EC1118 to finish the job. Uh, you can get uh, some off flavors from that. Uh, the kind of flavors uh, really do depend on how moldy it was. So and with the mold flavors and whatnot, those will age out eventually. Uh, right, what I have right here, what I'm drinking today, my back breaking blackberry mellow mel. Uh, I did have a lot of mold on there, and here it is in the glass. 
and it was very funky. But a lot of that funk has aged out and it is becoming very pleasant. I don't know, when I first bottled it, I could not drink it at all. It was just too funky for me. Others did seem to enjoy it, uh, but that's really not my thing. Um, but I'm very glad I kept it around and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So yeah, the uh, best thing to do is just to try to prevent the mold and uh, punch down that fruit cap on a daily basis. So I've touched on MEAs before, mead explosion accidents, and there is no way to stop it from happening. It will happen. The best way to do anything about it is to prevent it, or not to, to mitigate it, is to use a bucket that is a couple of gallons bigger than the amount that you're uh, fermenting. That way when you do add your nutrients and you mix it or whatever, it's got sp head space so that when it does foam up, you've got the extra space. And also when you're doing the mixing and whatnot, uh, just start off slow to get that degas going so it doesn't like just degas fast. You want to degas it a little slow so that the, uh, the explosion is uh, a bit tamer than if all of a sudden it just happened. Bottle bombs. You get your lovely mead all done up and you let it sit for several months and then you go and you try it and you hear it hiss. That means it's carbonating. Carbonating in the bottle. It was not done fermenting. So we have, we have an issue with that because these lovely wine bottles are not meant for carbonation. They are fragile from the inside out. So what do we do with the rest of those bottles that we have once we hear that initial hiss? Well, first, get them someplace safe where they won't do any real damage if they explode. Uh, I currently have one that's done this to myself, my prickly pear, uh, it decided to carbonate. So I currently have all my bottles in a big Rubbermaid tub with a locking lid. That way if something explodes in there, it's contained. So yeah, once all the bottles are in a safe spot until you can actually spend the time to do something with it, you want to get some uh, safety gear. You want some eye protection because the bottles may explode. You don't want all that glass flying in your eyes or face, so a face shield would be recommended. Also, something else would be uh, gloves. You want to protect your hands. Uh, I would use heavy-duty kitchen rubber gloves, uh, very, the very thick ones. That way, you're protected from the glass, you're protected from the liquids as that happens. Uh, the next thing you want to do when it's time to start opening, wrap the bottle in a towel a towel that you don't mind that will end up with glass or stained depending on the color of the mead. Uh, wrap the bottle in that and then you'll want to very carefully and slowly uh, pop the top. If it's uh, cork just very carefully uh, remove the cork. I would actually invest in a uh, corker that is very easy to use because you want to make all your movements very slow and methodical. You don't want any jerking or anything because you don't want to all of a sudden like, go to pop the top off and it explodes and the top comes flying off. You want uh, like a double lever one where you can just slowly press down. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, corker that I would prefer to use uh, for that. Um, then once the top's off, drink. Uh, start drinking it. Carbonated meads are very tasty. They bring the flavors and the aromas to your taste buds and nose and make it uh, quite an enjoyable experience. Uh, but if you've got like 30 bottles of them, you can't 
drink 30 bottles at one time, or at least you really shouldn't, because uh, that's just silly, and don't do that. Uh, so what you want to do is take the cork up, once you've got the top popped, uh, just let it sit for a little bit. You don't have to worry about uh, oxidization or anything like that because, well, it's off-gassing CO2, so that pushes all the oxygen off. And then when it comes time, what you want to do is you want to put some temporary corks. So these guys here are called T-corks. So it's a plastic top and a cork, and you can just pop these in. And the nice thing about these things are they're easy to put in and they're easy to take off. So if they do start to uh, continue to ferment or whatever, these will slowly pop off and they will expunge out the pop off by themselves rather than blowing up the bottles. Um, so yeah, once you have these guys in, all your bottles, I would go through and uh, once a week, uh, just pop these off yourself, release any gas that they may have, and then uh, put them back on. Uh, remember, sanitize though. You want to make sure these guys are sanitized. So sanitize them, pop them in, wait a week. Uh, soon after they're no longer hissing after a week, move to a month. If they're not hissing after a month, try every two months. Uh, just pop them off and then uh, after about six months then I wouldn't worry too much about it anymore and I would go ahead and put a proper corks on them. Uh, and so that's uh, how you deal with bottle bombs. So you save your meads in a safe manner. These guys Get a bunch of them. They're lifesavers. Also, when you have a bottle open and you don't have any uh, of these guys kicking around, you can just pop one of these guys in so you can save it up an open bottle. So you have a mead that's cloyingly sweet. That's just way too sweet. Or, like mentioned earlier, the yeast cut out too early and not even the EC1118 will uh, finish the job. So what do you do? Well, you can make a super dry mead, and then you blend the two. You just make up a big old batch of the, the super dry mead, and then uh, get a glass and pour a little bit of the cloying mead in, keeping note of how much you put in, and then add a little bit of the, uh, the dry one until you find a nice blend that you like, and then you just mix it up that ratio. Uh, another thing that you can do with a cloyingly sweet mead is uh, add wood. Uh, oak age, mesquite age, apple, cherry. Grab some uh, wood that's uh, good and clean, sanitize it, and chuck it in. And the tannins that come out of the wood uh, help with the cloying. So it gives you a more of a puckeringness. So if you've ever had like a really dry, oaked uh, red wine, you get like a puckering effect happening, and that's from the tannins. So grapes have a lot of tannins. Uh, oak has a lot of tannins. So you get like a really astringent puckering effect in those red wines. We well, use the uh, oak, or pretty much any wood, and it will draw out the tannins into the mead, which alleviate the cloyingness. So you have a much uh, drier perception of the mean. And I've, I've done that several times and I've been very pleased with the results of the mead. Uh, you can end up with a mead that is overly dry though doing that as well so be careful with doing that. And then on the flip side you have a super dry mead. Well there's a couple things you can do with that is one make a cloyingly sweet mead and do the blending thing or you can just straight up back sweeten the dry mead. Just take your mead, add some honey to it to the point uh, where you like it, and then uh, be sure to uh, add the potassium sorbate and the potassium metabisulfites to make sure that the yeasts are done and dead. 
that way you don't uh, give them more food to eat and you end up uh, fermenting it out even further. So uh, back sweetening is a good way to fix that dry mead. Over flavoring the mead. So you add it way too much cinnamon or way too much fruit or way too much oak to something. Well, what can you do with that? Well, blending is our friend here as well. You just blend it with a traditional made with the same honey. And uh, I usually like to make uh, four gallon batches. I say three, but it's usually four gallons. And then I have a one gallon batch off to the side. That way I can use it for blending if needed, or just to try the honey by itself as a traditional. So you have over flavored your meat, you just blend it with the traditional that you made with it until you get the flavoring that you like. Uh, some of the other, some of the flavorings can also be aged out. Uh, some of them you cannot age out, some of them you can. Uh, it's just a matter of practice on learning what can and what cannot. But for the most part, age does wonderful things. Uh, the flip side of that is under flavoring. Well, that's easy. You just add more of whatever it is you're trying to flavor. You not enough cinnamon? Add another cinnamon stick. Wait a little bit. Uh, not enough fruit? Add more fruit. Let it go through a, a longer secondary with more fruit or rack it off onto some new fruit. Have a fruit blend. So the under flavor, that's just as easy to fix with adding extra stuff. And lastly, uh, meat just tastes bad. Um, the same with meat is, if it doesn't taste good, wait a year. Uh, age does do a lot of wonderful things to meads. Uh, like I mentioned, my uh, blackberry, my back breaking blackberry mead, uh, I really did not like it uh, when I first bottled it. Uh, it just tasted awful to me. Other people liked it, it was not what I enjoyed. Uh, here it is two years later and I'm starting to enjoy it. So, uh, it definitely has the blackberry in it. There's still a little bit of funk in there, but it's not bad. Um, but yeah, this was my most problematic mead that I've done. Uh, we used uh, fresh blackberries, uh, so it's back breaking blackberry Mellow Mel. It was backbreaking because I went out and I picked the 30 pounds of blackberries myself and then I processed them by giving them a good quick rinse and then tossed them into, I tossed them straight into the fermenter at that point. I added a couple Camden tablets, uh, waited it a day and then I added the water and screw up number one happened right there. I added, I had I was gonna add 14 pounds of honey. So I had a one gallon jug, which is 12, and a two pound jar. So I added the two pound jar, mixed it all up, completely forgetting to add the, the one gallon of honey. Uh, so with that, the yeast did their thing. I started, ended up getting mold because the yeast weren't doing as much as they should have been doing, mostly because there wasn't enough sugar. So I did pitch more yeast. Um, I punched on the fruit cap and there was mold happening and I just kind of let it do its thing. Uh, eventually I just decided to rack it over into secondary and I left it in secondary for about, I don't know, it was about eight months just doing its thing, clarifying. I'd get uh, a little thin layer of stuff on top so I'd rack it again after that and I just kept going doing that and then uh, when I went to bottle it I checked the gravity and the gravity was crazy low for what it should have been and so I did a spirit indication test on it just uh, try and figure out what the heck was going on and 
it was at that point when I realized that I had forgotten a gallon of honey because the ABV of this guy is 3.5%. So it's essentially blackberry juice. So yeah, I it had been bottled and all that. And there was not much I could do after that fact, except just kind of let, let it age longer. And so that's what I've done, and age has helped it a lot. So uh, that is essentially week eight, everybody. So if you've enjoyed this video and learned something, found it useful, whatever, please thumbs up it. It really is encouraging to see those thumbs up. If you have not done so, I would like to invite you to uh, go ahead and subscribe as well. That way you'll be here for next week when we do your guys' questions and that your guys' questions, my answers. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, hurry up. Down in the comments, shoot me a PM, whatever. Get me those questions so that uh, I got something to talk about next week. Uh, on top of that, we're cracking into that Joe's Ancient Orange Meat as well, giving that a sample. So you guys don't want to miss out on that, so please subscribe. And with that, my friends, you should have a pen of awesome because I know I will. Cheers, everybody.